We are in Isaiah chapter 63. Is that right? So if that's the case, let's turn to Hosea chapter 5. Okay, we're going to explore some um, off-the-wall ideas tonight. I know that comes as news to you. you know, we're usually so conservative and centerline doctrine kinds of people, but I thought tonight, I'm being facetious, of course, we are going to look at some things that are conjectural. In the Old Testament, I am particularly fond of the commentators that come from a Jewish background. They generally have insights and a feeling for the text that uh, Gentile commentators, no matter how educated, still don't quite have the same insights. One of the contemporary commentators that you should keep your ear cocked to is a guy named Arnold Fuckenbaum, who is a local, published, delightful guy, excellent materials, and has insights about prophecy that seem to escape the notice of many of the other classical reviewers. Much of the material that I steal is always from somebody, so the, I'm going to lean tonight on some views that I first, they may not be unique to him, but I first heard from Arnold Fuchtenbaum stuff. And uh, I won't try to build the whole case on, on his viewpoint. I want to share it with you because I think it's provocative. But I also want you to understand this is conjectural. It's, uh, it's, it's an unorthodox kind of view about end-time prophecy. So uh, I'd like to call your attention to the last verse of... Hosea chapter 5. God is speaking through Hosea. In verse 15, he says, I will go and return to my place. Well, now, wait a minute. In order for someone to return to their place, they must have left it. Does that make sense? I will go and return to my place for how long? till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. Now, what this verse suggests, God speaking, that he has left his place, but is going to return to his place for a while, and he will stay in his place until an event occurs. What event? till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face, and in their affliction they will seek me early. When you get into this text, you discover several things. One is the word offense there in the Hebrew is singular. It doesn't say, you know, till they acknowledge their sins in a generic sense. But until they acknowledge their offense specific one, a specific offense. And out of this verse, plus a handful in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and elsewhere, there's several passages similar to this one. I'm just picked this one as the typical one. That implies there will be an event occur in the life of the nation Israel in which they're going to acknowledge a very specific offense. We're not talking now about passages, and there are many of these, where they are to acknowledge their general idol worshiping times at Babylon or whatever. You know, as you go through the history of Israel, there's many occasions where it's a, you know, God uh, calls them to repent of their sins, plural, and, and in some respects specific to that time. This passage and several others seem to allude prophetically to another occasion. This gives rise to a viewpoint that we're going to discover in, well, let's, in fact, maybe at this point what we'll do, hold your place here, we'll come back, You'll see why I'm getting into this right now is let's turn to Isaiah 63. We talked in Isaiah 61 and other passages about the day of vengeance of our God, right? Jesus came the first time to fulfill his role as our Goel, our kinsman redeemer. Became incarnate so that he could walk in the Footsteps, in effect, in the shoes, if you will, of Adam, but sin-free. And one of his titles that the Bible uses is the, Jesus is called the last Adam, that is the fulfillment. He corrected, so to speak, or paid for the error that Adam accomplished and devolves upon us, the disease we call sin. So by going to the cross, he performed his role as our kinsman redeemer. And we talk a lot about that throughout the Scripture. 
We see it modeled again and again and again throughout the Scripture. The classic example, the colorful, beautiful, eloquent example being the book of Ruth, the time of the Judges. In that incredible story, Boaz plays the role of the hero there. He's the kinsman redeemer. And by his act of redemption under the Levitical law, he accomplishes the return of Naomi to the land, Naomi being, in effect, a type or an allegory or a model, if you will, of Israel. And at the same time, he also takes unto himself a Gentile bride by the name of Ruth. And there are many, many details of that beautiful story that are not only a beautiful love story, but even more than that, a foreshadowing essential to our understanding of Revelation 5. You really won't understand Revelation 5 unless you really understand the book of Ruth. But there Jesus is, in his first coming, fulfilling the role of our Goel, the kinsman redeemer. And the libraries are full of books commenting on his role as our Goel, our kinsman redeemer. And we call him our redeemer, among many other things. But there is another role that he is to fulfill. The kinsman had two roles. To his family, he could be the kinsman redeemer. To the enemies of the family. He was the avenger of blood. That's a portrayal of Jesus Christ that we don't dwell on much. And yet, the Old Testament and the New is loaded with those perspectives. And we get a whole additional view of what the Mashiach Nagi is all about, what the Messiah the King is all about. One of those glimpses occurs in Isaiah 63. Verse 1, who is this that cometh from Edom? Now, Edom is both a place, but there's also a pun involved. Edom is the land of Esau. Edom is a location. But the word means red. And you'll see why it's a pun. It's a colorful pun as we go here. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? Now, you should understand something else. Basra is an alternative name for a place that's also known as Petra. As Petra. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Who do you suspect is being talked about here? Who is this that is glorious in his apparel? Now, again, in the prophetical idiom, apparel usually speaks of righteousness, or lack thereof. Our garments are as well, f- filthy rags. We'll use that until we get to chapter 64, and I'll tell you what it really says. Well, I'll tell you now. It means, the word in the Hebrew means used menstrual cloths. The King James translators were a little kind to you about picking some euphemism. That's our righteousness. Filthy rags is saying it politely. Isaiah was actually a little more graphic than that. What's his righteousness? Always is white, in some cases shiny. See, the idiom of the apparel alludes to the righteousness. Well, who is this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? So you can make a guess already who is in view here. I who speak in righteousness mighty to save. Well, now that sentence clarifies the scope of this verse, doesn't it? I, first person singular, who's speaking? God. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Who is that? The Mashiach Magid, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. None other. Not only does it point to him, there's no one else that qualifies in those shoes, right? Who is this that cometh from Edom? Well, what's, see, it's an interesting question. What's Christ doing coming from Edom? with dyed garments from Basra, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I who speak in righteousness mighty to save. Why art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him who treadeth in the wine fat? Now you and I aren't familiar with that procedure, but we could sort of imagine it, having a bin of grapes and going in there and stomping the grapes to get the wine, right? Now, what do you suspect happens to the clothes you're wearing if you're in that particular task? They get splattered with what? Wine fat, or the redness, if you will, of the wine, right? That's what this looks like. It's an analogy. Then the answer comes. 
I have trodden the wine press alone. And by the way, what wine press are we talking about here? There's another idiom in the scripture speaking of God's wrath, exactly right. Pouring out, the, it's a strange idiom for our ears, but the idea of bowls pouring out wrath is a very common idiom in the scripture. And in fact, Revelation climaxes with seven bowls, vials in the King James, the three three bowls, of God's wrath being poured out. The book of Revelation has hundreds, not a few, hundreds of sevens. The seven sealed book, the seven letters. In our commentary notes, we've got, I've forgotten how many, dozens of these, these uh, examples. Of course, the, the famous ones are the seven seals of the, the seven sealed book. The seventh seal gets organized apparently into seven trumpets, right? The seventh trumpet leads to the seven angels with the seven bowls of God's wrath. That's the climax of the book of Revelation. They, they pour out these bowls. The climactic order of those bowls being poured out, the last one is poured out upon the air. If you're reading Revelation, what's all that about? What you have to keep in mind is who is the prince of the power of the air? See, it's actually being poured out in a sequence that's climax climaxes by Satan's throne. So this idea of pouring out the wrath, sometimes spoken as the wine of his wrath, it's a strange idiom to our ears, but a common one in the idioms of the, of the uh, Levitical uh, alphabet here. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the peoples there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger. It's hard to imagine Christ angry, isn't it? I mean, you and I are so conditioned by so many of the narratives in the gospel. You know, we always see Christ compassionate, forgiving, blessing, healing, right? Yes, he gets angry when he drives the money changers out. That happens a couple of times. We see him use fairly strong language to the Pharisees. But we generally don't view Christ as angry, do we? Is he going to be angry? Well, let's read on. I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Whose blood is splattered on his garments in this idiom here, this vision here? Not Christ's blood. It was shed on the cross 2,000 years ago, roughly. Whose blood is on his garments? The blood of his enemies. That's a strange idea, isn't it? For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, verse 4, and the year of my redeemed is come. He's paid the price. He purchased the title deed. To use perhaps a sloppy idiom, I'm going to say the planet Earth is in escrow. He's got title. He's purchased it on a cross. The usurper is defeated and knows it. But he's like a wounded animal. Doesn't stop fighting just because he's mortally wounded. But is the victory certain? Absolutely. Has Christ taken possession of that which he purchased? No. Except in some ultimate title sense. Who's running around running things on this planet? The prince of this world. Another title of an angel gone wrong. But the day will come when it is his duty, his commitment, to take possession of that which is his. And there are many parables he told of the remote land order coming back to regain what he left. The day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury had upheld me. I will tread down the peoples in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. Wow. Heavy-duty stuff, isn't it? Let's just pause here and pop back to Revelation 5. Just this is all, this is the refresher of what I'm sure you've heard before, and if not, 
I do invite you to really do a study. I'm one of these weird guys that when I run into a new Christian that really wants to learn the Bible, said, so, Chuck, where should I start? Gospel of John, good ground. Book of Genesis, not bad. Lots of places. My favorite, Book of Revelation. <laughs> Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But I've never seen it fail. You can't just read it and get it on your own because it depends too much on understanding the rest of the Bible. But it's the only book in the Bible that has the audacity, if I can phrase it that way, to say, read me, I'm special. No other book in the Bible says, hey, read me. Lots of places says, read the Word of God in some collective sense. Only one book has the I don't know what other word, audacity, to say, hey, read me, I'm special. Blessed he is he that readeth this book. Not once, all through the book. Why do you get such a special blessing from Revelation? And notice it's singular, not plural. You can always tell that somebody hasn't studied it because they say revelations. Don't follow that trap. It just betrays that you haven't read the book. Because the first sentence tells the whole story, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's singular. It's the revelation of of a person, which God gave unto him. Unto whom? Jesus Christ. What? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. And it's my suspicion that this somehow implies a point in which he regained his full knowledge of his mission. See, when he became incarnate, the presumption I make him, not a theologian, is there were some things that he didn't know that the Father did. For example, he says, No man knows the day nor the hour, not the angels in heaven, not the Son, but the Father only. That's a strange verse. If for no other reason, it indicates there's something at that moment, at least, the Father knew the Son didn't. Now, is that true today? I don't think so. I think he has all knowledge. But I think there was a point at which he regained, and that's what I think the book of Revelation is recording. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, and he sent and signified it, rendered into signs unto his servant John. The reason the revelation is so mysterious to us is it's all in code. But every code is explained in the Scripture. If you know your Old Testament, you read it comfortably. The reason we stumble is that we haven't done our homework. But that's one of the reasons it's such a blessing, because if you go through the book of Revelation with a guide, a good concordance is enough, but it's even better if you have some tapes or commentary from someone... But by anybody who really takes the Bible seriously, I'm not talking about someone who allegorizes it. I'm not talking to someone who spiritualizes it as a, another say, way of saying the same thing. I'm from someone who takes the Bible seriously. God says what he means and means what he says. And every time I have made a mistake in my understanding of the Scripture, there have been many times, it's always when I didn't take it literally enough. But the point is, uh, by going through that, I encourage you, those of you that might be led to do that, don't hesitate to undertake a personal study of the book of Revelation and get, get tapes or commentary by someone you're comfortable with, Chuck Smith, Hal Lindsey, or whoever, and go through it. It'll be the most incredible blessing of your life. And I suggest if you finish that and you survive that ordeal, and of course it'll be a blessing. Going to Genesis from there is not a bad move because everything that's finished here started there, and you'll understand Genesis only after Revelation. And as you go through various books of the Bible, you come back to Revelation after, say, a few years, and you'll understand it like you never understood anything before. It's an incredible experience. But anyway, getting back to Revelation 5, just to, is this, we see this throne in heaven, and John's caught up there, and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll to loose the seals? And if you study this carefully, there's lots of reasons we believe this scroll is a title deed. That leads to a whole other study. I won't get into that. It's titled either what? The earth? Maybe even more than that. Maybe the universe. But it's, it's apparently the title deed of that which Adam forfeited. And verse 3 says, And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll, neither look upon it. Notice it has to be a man. Not an angel. Not a cherubim. No man. It has to be a kinsman of Adam. That's why Jesus Christ was incarnate. That's why he's born of the virgin so that he could be in the role of our kinsman, Redeemer. But no man was found worthy. That's the generic. There would be fortunately an exception. 
John understood the significance of what's going on. You and I might be a little mystified, but John understood. He says in verse 4, I sobbed convulsively because no man was found worthy to open and read the book and neither look on it. John understood the significance. Does that mean the earth and man is lost forever? No, no, no. Verse 5. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. That's one of the titles of Jesus Christ introduced in Genesis chapter 49, verse 9. The root of David, root here in the sense of the family tree. Sounds like a pun, but it is. You know, it's the root of the tree. Who? David. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the, the root of David, both titles of Jesus Christ. And by the way, Jewish titles of Jesus Christ. Hath prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seals. And I, John, beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood the Lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, idiomatic, of course, which are seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And by the time you get to chapter 5, we've identified all of those earlier in the book as to what those mean. He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. And the whole book of Revelation from chapter 5 through 19 is what happens as he performs the role of the kinsman redeemer, which includes the role of the avenger of blood. And we go through with the seals being opened and the trumpets being blown and the bowls being poured out. And we, this all climaxes in chapter 19. So we might pop over to chapter 19. I love verse 10. Let's just start there. I fell on his feet to worship him. This angel says, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's an interesting principle to remember. Every prophecy in the Scripture, whether it's a, it's a major passage announcing some big thing or whether it's a subtle hint by some idiom in, in the Levitical law, they all point to whom? Jesus Christ. Tabernacle sat on sockets of silver. What is silver Levitically? The blood, the redemptive coin, redemption coin. What is the tabernacle? What, what does it rest on? Blood, in effect. Even Judas uses that idiom. When he throws the 30 pieces of silver back in the temple and says, Behold, I've betrayed innocent blood. Every little subtle detail points to Jesus Christ. Verse 11, I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse. My daughter loves this passage. See, it proves horses are in heaven. <laughs> I saw it heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. you got to be kidding. Who is faithful and true? There's only one. Who is the faithful and true witness? Huh? Are we keeping you up? <laughs> Who is the faithful and true witness? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, I just want to see if we're together. Okay. Thought maybe I got the wrong meaning here. And in righteousness he doth judge, that's no surprise, and make war. Hey, that's a surprise. When's the last time you remember in the Bible that Jesus Christ was armed and making war. Jericho, very good. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. No, he didn't. Jesus did. Read the last few verses of chapter 5 of Joshua, and you'll see who really fought the battle of Jericho. The captain of the Lord's host with a sword drawn. Joshua challenges them. Are you for us or our enemies? He says, take off your shoes. You're on hallowed ground. And Joshua worships him. Not like here where there's an angel earlier in verse 10, See thou do it not. Angels never allow themselves to be worshipped. There's one exception. He got into a lot of trouble. <laughs> but the one in chapter 5 commands worship and in fact uses the very phrase that Moses was confronted with in the burning bush. Take off your shoes, you're on hallowed ground. Why was that phrase used in Joshua 5? So Joshua would recognize the same guy. The voice of the burning bush. Who fought the battle of Jericho? Jesus did. In what's called, if you don't understand something, the way you cover that up is give it a big label. Call it a theophany. So you drop that at your bridge club and they figure you know, see? <laughs> and one of these old te strange Old Testament appearances of, of the, the second person of the Trinity. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Whose blood? 
His enemies, right on. And his name is called the Word of God. Interesting title of Jesus Christ. John uses it to open his gospel. The first three verses of the Gospel of John are the third genealogy of Christ in the Gospels. You find the first one in Matthew. Matthew was a Jew. He was interested in Jesus Christ as the Mashiach, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He takes it from Abraham through David, through the royal line, through Solomon, down through Joseph, the legal father. Luke, is a, Mark doesn't have a genealogy. He's interested in Jesus as the servant. You don't worry about the pedigree of a servant. Mark is the only one that doesn't have a genealogy. Luke has a genealogy. He's a physician. He's interested in Christ's humanity. He takes it from Adam to Noah, of course, right on through to Abraham. And from Abraham to David, they're the same as Matthew. But what David, Luke takes a left turn. He didn't go through Solomon. He goes through Nathan, another son of David. Why? Because he goes down through the genealogy that ends up being Mary's genealogy, proving that he had a bloodline to Adam. He was literally, obviously, a son of Adam. But not through the male line, not carrying the blood curse on Jeconiah from Jeremiah. You can follow that through. The virgin birth is hinted in Genesis, executed for a number of reasons, not the least of which is to end run the blood curse God pronounces on the royal line during the days of Jeconiah. Interesting thing. But you say, gee, that's only two genealogies. Yes, there is a genealogy in John, the first three verses. You don't recognize it because it's the genealogy of the pre-existent one. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Sounds like double talk until you study it carefully. He was God, and yet he was with God, meaning he was separate. It's an eloquent discussion of the Trinity. You can study the first three verses of John for your for the rest of your life and not explore it at all. But John uses this interesting title of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. He opens his gospel with it. He uses it in his epistles. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Again, the title of Christ. And he uses it here. You see, his name is called what? The Word of God. I love this definition. Somebody says, well, you know, Pilate asked cynically, what is truth? That was sort of a, a toss-away line, just an expression of cynicism. My wife did some research, came up with what I, my favorite definition, of, there are many definitions, I'm sure, of what you mean by truth. But let me tell you my favorite. Truth is when the word and the deed become one. From Genesis on, God promised that he would provide a redeemer. Told Adam, Noah, Abraham, David, I mean, right on through, right? In that manger in Bethlehem, God kept his word, as we might say it. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word of God. And the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. It's funny, you see the ancient, uh, you know, the Renaissance painters paint this. What is the sword coming out of his mouth? His word, you betcha. Hebrews 4.12 is your authority for that. That with it he would smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress. Oh, there's that phrase again of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is this guy? Jesus Christ. Don't be confused in Revelation 6 because there's a, white, a guy riding a white horse in Revelation chapter 6. And many commentators fall into the trap of saying that's obviously Jesus Christ. He's on a white horse, you know. Read it carefully. He's going forth conquering to conquer. Who are his buddies on the other three horses with him? Death, famine, he's in bad company. No, that's the false Christ. And he's such a good imitator, he confuses even many commentators. No, the, the one on the white horse that we're talking about is in Revelation 19, not 6, in my view. But again, don't believe anything I tell you. Acts 17, 11 still applies. Luke warns you don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you. Receive the word with all readiness of mind, have your open mind, but search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. Anyway, back to Isaiah 63. 
we can go on, but there's a, there's a strange thing about Isaiah 63. We have this vision of Christ, blood-stained, fighting his enemies, but verse 1 bothers us. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? Gee, I thought he's coming to the Mount of Olives. I thought all the nations came to war against Jerusalem, and indeed they do. Lots of passages in the Old Testament and the New. Zechariah 12, Zechariah 14, and on and on and on. Revelation 16, they gathered together in a place which is called in the Hebrew tongue Har Megiddo. Har Mount Megiddo. Well, I'm a little confused. All the nations are coming against Jerusalem. Well, what's he doing fighting for his own, apparently, out east at Petra or Basra? What's going on here? There is a view. I wouldn't oversell this, but I think it's interesting to show you, at least share it with you. Let's get back to Hosea. Hosea chapter 5 is one of several passages, and I'm just going to, I don't want to overdo it, so we'll just take a couple and look at it. Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. What is the offense that we're talking about? What is the primary major offense? in the end times that Israel is being held accountable for. Recognizing the Messiah. Exactly. When Jesus presented himself, and most of this you'll find in Luke 19 as an example, came over to Jerusalem riding the donkey as Zechariah 9.9 predicted. On the very day that Daniel predicted. The very date that Daniel predicted. And he holds them accountable. As he gets to Jerusalem, he weeps over Jerusalem. Triumphal entry. He's presenting himself as the Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah of the King, to Israel. And he weeps over Jerusalem. Why? He says, because you did not recognize this thy day. Remember, we went through this before. But then he goes on to say, now they are hidden from thy sight. Israel is there declared by the Son of God to be blinded to the reality of what could have been their destiny had they received him then. Okay, they're blinded. How long are they blinded? Paul tells us in Romans 11, 25, Israel is blinded until, I love that word, and every time you see the word until, it's usually a very pivotal verse. They're blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. God has set them aside for a while to open the door of his grace in a very special way. Not that it wasn't opened before, don't misunderstand me, but in a very special way that we call the Ecclesia, the Church. But there is a day when the Church itself, as an entity, as a mechanism of God's dealing, will be completed. The fullness of the Gentiles will be come in. Then what happens? God once again deals with Israel, and more importantly, deals with the entire world through Israel. Jesus Christ comes back twice, once for His Church and once for Israel. Once is what we call the rapture. We take that word from the Latin vulgate, which is the word in the First Thessalonians for being snatched up, rapturo. It's a strange word because the word rapture doesn't appear in the Scripture, yet we use it as that label for that event. As opposed to the second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes back in power to take charge. I'm being very good. I'm not using more street-wise idioms here. I'm behaving myself tonight. Now, the question is, One of the interesting enigmas is when did Israel reject their Messiah? Clearly on the triumphal entry, he was rejected. There are some that believe that was just the playing out of a more definitive event of his rejection. And some scholars point to Matthew chapter 12 in the chronology of Matthew as the day that they blow it, finally. The reason they believe this is because in chapter 13 of Matthew, he changes his entire approach. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus presents seven parables. They're called so-called kingdom parables. In the middle of that chapter, he explains to his disciples that the reason, in fact, they ask him in verse 10 of Matthew 13, 
Why speakest thou in parables? He answered and said unto them, verse 11, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. In other words, in public he speaks in riddles. And we're all taught, well, those parables, that they're teaching aids. No, they're not. I mean, yes, they are, but they're also designed so that his own will hear and understand, others won't. That's rather weird. You think that's Chuck Mistler interpretation? What's going on? See, for them, for you it is given, but to them it's not. That those are the people out there, you see. For unto whosoever hath to him it shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. That's pretty interesting language. Therefore I speak unto them in parables, because they, seeing, see not. Hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For this people's heart is become gross. Their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they shall see, and your ears, for they shall hear. Verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and ha or have not heard them. Hear therefore the parable of the sower, and then goes on to interpret for them what the first of the seven parables meant. We won't go through the parables, obviously, that's peripheral to our interest tonight. But I want you to notice verse 34, where the style, the, the method, is again commented on. Verse 34, All these things spoke Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spoke he not unto them. In other words, he only from this point on, chapter 12 on, he speaks in public always in parables. Or if I may, if I may be allowed a little license, always in riddles. And he only spoke to the public in parables or riddles. From Not always, but from this point. See, Sermon on the Mount, he didn't do that. Back in chapter 6, 7, and so on of Matthew, he lays it on the line. But see, from this point on, he's now speaking mystically. Why? Well, verse 35 says, That it might be fulfilled that was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now, that's kind of interesting. That means that the content of these parables will not be found in the Old Testament. See, these parables are understandable from the Old Testament. They're not kept secret from the foundation of the world, are they? He's revealing something here in this chapter that's been kept hidden from the foundation of the world, which means the subject of those parables is something that was not in the Old Testament, at least not expressly in the Old Testament. Paul answers that part of the picture in Ephesians 3 by pointing out that which was hidden in the Old Testament is the church. These seven parables turn out to speak to the ecclesia, this peculiar, interesting, fascinating, mystical thing that Christ announces here in chapter 13 and, of course, gets fulfilled in Acts 2 onwards. The church. Strange, strange. The more you study the entity, this mystical thing called the church, the more you study it, the more baffling it is. It has all kinds of attributes that were not true in the Old Testament, nor will be true in the tribulation. It's a very special period with very special blessings, very special privileges. In fact, it's so incredible, that's what makes it too easy. We have a tough time swallowing grace. It must be something we've got to do. No, that's blasphemy. God's done it all. But, 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 no, no. God's done it all. That's for the asking. He's got a destiny for you that's so fantastic, you can't be eligible for it by anything you do. Keep the law perfectly. That's not possible. Well, you, unless you do that, you aren't eligible. No problem. He's paid the ticket in advance. He's paid your admission. 100%, 90, not 50 or 99%, all of it. He's paid 100% of it. To try to add to that is blasphemy. It's, in, it's impugning what he's already done for you. And it's available for the asking. A destiny for you that's so fantastic you can't be eligible on your own. He's taking care of the whole thing. The church. Boy, what an interesting entity. Interesting entity. Anyway, so what happened in chapter 12 to cause Jesus to shift his entire approach, his entire style of presentation. Well, earlier in the chapter 12, he's Lord of the Sabbath, he heals on the Sabbath day. You know, I really don't know. It seems they always record 
these events that occur on the Sabbath day. You could get the impression, I don't believe this is true, I get the impression from reading the Gospels that Jesus went out of his way to stir up trouble. Didn't he ever heal a leper on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Thursday? Now, he obviously, I suspect, did it many times, but the ones that turn out to be significant, especially significant, are those when he does the Sabbath day. And that's, of course, what happens many times. But here, of course, he heals, you know, this paralyzed man and so forth, right? But we get down to verse 24. The Pharisees heard and said, This fellow doth cast out demons, but by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Bad news, Pharisees. Don't believe him if you don't want to. That's your privilege. But don't do what you just did. You're ascribing his power to Satan. Ooh. Yeah, that's different than saying, gee, I don't accept Jesus Christ. I don't believe it. I don't believe the Bible. Someone like that has problems, but they're repairable. They can repent. But to take the position that they did is somehow crossing the line. They're acknowledging the reality of what he did, but ascribing his source, his power, his allegiance, if you will, to Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. He's talking like any military general. You don't divide yourself and fight against yourself. That's dumb. That's what he's saying. Goes on, and if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? See, he's just got through casting out, in effect, Satan. Are you see, I'm doing it by the power of Satan. He's saying you guys aren't even logically connected. Verse twenty-seven: If I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Oh boy, you guys are in deep trouble. You thought you were in yogurt by disbelief. You're a deeper yogurt now. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? That's interesting. And then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me. That's interesting. See, Jesus here is in the, is in the role, idiomatically, of the spoiler. The model he's conjuring up, mentally at least, is that Satan's bound and he's spoiling his house. See, if he's going to cast out demons, somehow, by some procedure, Satan is, in, is trampled somehow to let that happen. Huh? That's the implication of the, of the idiom he's using here. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. I'm reminded of some self-styled investigative reporters that are running around the landscape from time to time on talk shows and what have you that seem to make their practice attacking brethren in the body of Christ. Various authors to whom they slight, they have some quarrel or another, which is fine. They should do that and confront them directly. But it fascinates me how the, the, the style today of so many of accusing the brethren publicly I did a little study of what the accuser of the brethren is. I know where that doctrine comes from. <laughs> Makes me very uncomfortable when I see that happen. Does that mean we should go be silent? No, but it does mean that we deal with these doctrines within the body and not on secular radio. It's interesting how there are those that would call themselves members of the body of Christ that spend their time dividing the body. Tragic. Then we get to the famous verses 31 and 32, but they now, I think, have a different complexion than you may have perceived before. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven man. Amen. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this age or in the age to come. The so-called impardonable sin. Let me hasten to add something. If you're worried about it, that means you haven't done it. If you're concerned about having somehow done that, who's telling you to be concerned? Holy Spirit. So he's, he's still in there pulling for you. So don't get all hung up that, gee, you know, I've done the impardonable sin. Because if you have, you wouldn't be worrying about it. You follow my logic. 
either make the tree good or its fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. Oh, generation of vipers. I love that phrase. You know, if you have to understand how the Pharisees felt about snakes, enigmatically, Levitically, what's a snake? The Nakash, the shining one from Genesis 3. He's saying, hey guys, you're a generation of vipers. He's calling them the seed of the serpent from Genesis 3.15. How can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the tre evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account of it in the day of judgment. Oh boy, do I have a lot to pray about. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. You know, I, I, I come to verse 38 and I crack up. He just got through healing so dramatically they have to ascribe it to Satan, right? Then they have the chutzpah to come and say, hey, by the way, we'd like to see a sign. And Jesus says, no kidding. No, he says, verse 39, He's answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. I love this passage because first of all, I don't know how to get three days and three nights between Friday and Sunday. So I'm one of these screwballs that believes Jesus Christ was crucified on a Wednesday. And don't misunderstand me. Many good scholars hold the view and justify it on Friday, and other good scholars hold on Wednesday. So I won't get into that whole controversy. Just be aware that there are viewpoints. But this is one of the reasons that we really think it's not three partial days counted as a full day, but three days and three nights, because the city. Most of us see this and presume that what he is referring to is his resurrection. He's crucified, right? Dead and buried. And just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the big fish, so the Son of Man was three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, right? No problem. There are some that believe that this that prophecy is a double reference. It refers to his resurrection, certainly. Don't misunderstand me. But it's interesting that we come back to Hosea 5.15. I will go and return to my place, God says. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. What offense? The rejection of the Messiah. There are comparable passages in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, again, where the word for the offense is clearly in the Hebrew a singular, specific indication. Till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction, they will seek me early. And to get to the point, there are those that believe that the Antichrist and the Armageddon scenario, all the nations come against Jerusalem. The remnant follows the instructions of the Messiah who told them in Matthew 24, verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever reads, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee. Don't even grab your coat if you're in the field. Split like now, Remember? Where do they split to? Other passages in the Old Testament indicate that they're going to take refuge in Petra or Basra. Now, why does Satan care? You know, one of the things that used to puzzle me a lot is I can understand from Revelation 12 that Satan has had this plot against the Messianic line. When God told Adam and Eve that there was, there was going to be one of their offspring that was going to be deliverer, he took right on after Cain and Abel and got that whole story, thinking he'd won, only to find out Seth, there's some more and so on. As we go through, all through the Scripture, we find again and again Satan maneuvering. The more God reveals of his plan, the more he's allowed to focus his attack. To do what? To break the will of God. And you, you can study the whole Bible from that viewpoint. 
all through the kings. There's always some plot to kill off all the offspring, but there's always one secreted away that maintains the royal line and so on. The uh, slaughter of the babes in the days of Pharaoh, where Moses is miraculously taken care of. Or the slaughter of the babes by Herod in Bethlehem. All plots, satanic plots, to disconnect the royal line. Okay, Christ is born. He ministers. He goes to the cross. He's crucified. He's resurrected from the dead. You jump to the conclusion that wouldn't you think it's over? Hey, the victory is Christ. It's all over. Maybe not in Satan's mind. See, he makes you slow learn. And, of course, you know, uh, he's psychotic, and sin begets sin, and he's been sinner longer, longer than any of us can have any concept of. So I, would, I think you begin to understand some of this when you begin to look at him that way, at least. The point is, maybe there's some event. See, why is Satan so anti-Semitic today? He certainly is. All prejudice, all racial prejudice is bad, but there's something peculiarly strange about the world's animosity towards Israel. Why? Well, it's satanic. Fine. Why? Why does Satan care? There is a hypothesis by some scholars is that there's yet an event as a preceding condition to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Not the rapture. That's, that can happen anytime. But before Jesus comes back, they have to ask him. See, the idea is, is that I will go to my former place until they acknowledge their offense. In their affliction, the tribulation, they will seek me early. And the suggestion is, is that in Hosea chapter 6 is the prayer that they pray. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, he will heal us, he hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. There is a view that this may be a second, so to speak, reference to the prophecy of Jonah. And the idea that is suggested by some Hebrew scholars is that the remnant, the believing remnant, will flee Jerusalem at the abomination of desolation and go into hiding. And they will recognize their need to acknowledge Christ as their Messiah. And they ask him... They, they acknowledge their offense, they repent of it, and they request his coming. And on the third day from that point, he does go to bat for them. Where? Not in Jerusalem, in Basra. That's what Isaiah 63, by, in the minds of some, is an allusion to. Interesting viewpoint. Is it correct? I'm not sure. I, I'm very intrigued with it, because if nothing else, it helps us understand what motivation may underlie this strange preoccupation, if I can call it that, of Satan with not just the Jew, but especially the believing Jew, the so-called Messianic Jew, the Jews that recognize Jesus Christ as the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach. Interesting idea. I thought it would be worth sharing with you. I don't want to oversell it. It's just a viewpoint, but it's one I find provocative. But let's move on. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 7. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us. And the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior. I love this passage. It's speaking to whom? Israel. He is their Savior. This is another one of the 10,000 examples that God is dealing with Israel and the church separately. God is not through with Israel. The church isn't the replacement of Israel. Nonsense. He's speaking here of Israel. They are my people, and, they, and, and he was their Savior. In their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he hath turned to their enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered his de the days of old Moses and his people, saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within him? 
who led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name, who led them through the deep like a horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble as the beast goes down into the valley and the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory. Where are thy zeal and thy strength, the yearning of thine heart and of thy mercies toward me? Are they restrained? Doubtless thou art our father through Abraham. Be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and hardened our heart from thy fear? Return for thy servant's sake. The tribes of thine inheritance and the people of thy holiness have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trampled down thy sanctuary. We are thine. Thou didst never bear rule over them. They were not called by thy name. Plea of Israel. Our adversaries have trampled down thy sanctuary. It could be referring to Babylon, but it also could be referred to the Romans trampling down the temple in 70 A.D. But let's go on. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that thy mountains might flow down at thy presence as when the melting fire burneth. That sounds like it's out of Peter, doesn't it? Or Micah 1, either way. And the fire causeth the waters to boil and make thy name known to thine adversaries that the nations may tremble at thy presence. One of the strangest things, it's hard to visualize, but it's very vivid in the Scripture, both Old and New Testament, is this whole notion of a conflict, an open, knowledgeable conflict between God and the nations on the earth. That's weird. And we can understand unbelief. We can understand those kinds of things. But it's hard for us to imagine the world organ in an organized way taking up arms against God. And yet, that's what the first psalm talks about. I should explain that. In the Psalms, the, what we call the first psalm is actually an introduction in the Hebrew uh, Bible, I believe. That psalm 2 is really the first psalm. And Psalm 2 is exactly that. Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost talking about the futility of the nations taking up against the God of the universe. That's insanity. But coming. That the nations may tremble at thy presence. And when thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, Thou camest down the mountains, flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him who waiteth for him. That's interesting. It's very familiar to us because it's quoted in 1 Corinthians 2.9, but in a slightly different context. We're going to see the same idea in Isaiah 65 shortly. John 14, Revelation 21. For since the beginning of the world, man hath not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God beside thee, what he hath prepared for them who waiteth for him. That's got two sides of that coin. <laughs> you see, here in this context, it sounds a little ominous. Thou meetest him who rejoices and worketh in righteousness. Those who remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art angry. For we have sinned in whose, in whose continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are <laughs> as used menstrual cloths. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that call upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hidden thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father. We are the clay, and thou our potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. There's that idiom again. Paul uses it so often in Romans and elsewhere. Be not exceedingly angry, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness, Zion a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation, our holy and beautiful house, where our fathers praise thee, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou restrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very severely? I am sought by those who ask not for me. Chapter 65. That's an interesting phrase. 
I am sought by those who ask not for me. I am found by those who sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that is not called by my name. Boy, that's an interesting phrase. This is in Isaiah. This is in the Old Testament. That's interesting. Echoes Romans 10, Romans 11, and so on. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people that walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. This, of course, is speaking of false worship, idol worship. The altars of God were of unhewn stones. No tool was to touch it. When you talk about brick and so forth, you're talking not about the altars of God, but the altars of the heathen, that remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, that eat swine's flesh. If ever any Levitical insight, you realize he's not talking about proper worship here. <laughs> and the broth of abominable things is in their vessels, that say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are the smoke of, in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, it was written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom, your iniquities, and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, who have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servants' sakes, that I may not destroy them all. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah an, inher an inheritor of my mountains. And mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there, and Sharon shall be a fold of the flocks in the valley of Achor, a place for herds to lie down in, for my people that have sought me. The valley of Achor. Achor is a sign of worldly disobedience. It was the scene of the sin of Achan in, in uh, the book of Joshua, as you recall, Joshua 7, and uh, so on. But ye are they that forsake the Lord and that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. And by the way, there may be a cryptic allusion here to the tribe of Gad, which means troop, and there's a possibility, but I don't want to get all that here tonight. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, ye did not answer, and when I spoke, ye did not hear. But did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that in which I delighted not. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servant shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but ye shall be ashamed. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall wail for vexation of spirit. Wow. Is this the tribulation? Is there a contrast going on between the people that have been disobedient and unrepentant in contrast to some other group that he calls my servants here? Kind of interesting. Verse 15, ye shall leave your name for a curse upon my chosen, for the Lord God shall slay thee and shall call his servants by another name. That he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hidden from mine eyes. Heavy stuff. An angry God. Taking out vengeance upon the earth. Tough stuff. Tough stuff on this earth, on this planet earth, and maybe not very far away for lots of reasons. Now, as we go here, it's kind of interesting. The book of Isaiah is divided into 66 chapters. And we can't help but notice, of course, there's 66 books in the Bible. The first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah are of a particular style, sort of a heavy dirge. The last 27 chapters are a totally different style, it would seem. And it's, in fact, that gives rise to this weird idea that there are really two Isaiahs, which is nonsense. The Bible refutes that clearly. But still, we notice that there are 39 books of the Old Testament and 27 in the New. So the book of Isaiah is a model in miniature of the Bible in some interesting ways. Don't make too much of that because the chapter divisions are man's partitioning. Okay, nothing necessarily inspired about the way it's divided. It's convenient. But it's interesting. But it's also interesting that the last chapters of the book of Isaiah 
are very analogous to the final chapters of the book of Revelation. So much so that if I read to you out of context a few verses and gave you a written quiz, you would be ready to uh, document that these came from the book of Revelation. Listen to the following words. For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Revelation 21, okay, 2 Peter 3, and so on. Hebrews chapter 1, 12, so on. And there's more of this, we'll just go on. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall no more be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Doesn't that echo? You know, Revelation 7, Revelation 21, verse 4, and so on. There shall be no more in it an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. What does that mean? I have no idea. Well, I have a few ideas, but the main point is we, the more we study the millennium, the more questions it raises. Now, let's talk about that for a minute. Let's turn to Revelation 20. In Revelation 20, we have very clearly described a period of time that Satan is bound. Jesus Christ reigns on the earth for a thousand years. No. He reigns how long? Forever and ever. That's Handel, chapter 3. But there is a thousand-year period during which something occurs. I saw an angel come down from chapter 20, uh, from down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him to the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a season. And I saw the thrones, and it goes on. In the interest of time, you can read it. But basically, again, it mentions a thousand years six times in this chapter. And, of course, at the beginning of the thousand years, there is a resurrection. But verse 5, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed is holy. He that hath part in the first resurrection on, the, on such, the second death, hath no authority or power. But they shall be the priests of God of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when a thousand years is ended, then Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go and deceive the nations that which are on the four corners of the earth, and so on. Now, it's interesting. There are those that run around today that say that we're in the millennium. I love Chuck Smith's eloquent rebuttal of that position. Because if we're in the thousand years, then Satan's chain is too long. No, that's foolishness. But there is a literal thousand-year period. Now, the point is, this period is a millennium. Some people allegorize this. They're typically called amillennials. They don't believe in a literal millennium. And I obviously, for lots of reasons, reject that idea for many, many reasons. There really is a millennium. The Bible says so. The angel promised Mary that there would be. When the birth is announced, he will inherit the throne of his father David. There's going to be a literal rule upon the earth. Revelation 20 tells us only one thing, really, and that's the duration that Satan is bound. Most of what we know about the millennium comes from the Old Testament. But the more you study the millennium, the more mysterious it is, because it's not eternity. After the millennium, there will be a time that we will call the eternal state, where things are really different. That's not the millennium. In the millennium, it seems that major elements of the curse from Genesis 3 are lifted, but not all of them. And much of what we infer about the millennium is hidden here in Isaiah 65. Let's go back to Isaiah 65. There shall no more be no more in it, an infant of days, nor an old man that have not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old. That implies very long longevity. The guy's, guy died at a hundred years old. He was a mere child. <laughs> the guy dies that after a hundred years of living. A mere kid. That's weird. Something's really different. He dies, though, which means it's not eternity, is it? The child shall die a hundred years But the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. So there is sin. There's no sin in heaven. I mean, that's in Revelation 22, a different ballgame. We're in Revelation 20, so to speak, idiomatically. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and shall eat the fruit of them. 
That may sound strange to our ears, but this is a reversal of the curse in Deuteronomy 28, where the curse is expressed that, gee, you'll, you'll labor, but another will enjoy. He's reversing that. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat in front of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall enjoy the work of their hands. Don't take that for granted. That's a blessing. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And so come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. Really? And the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. So it sounds like the curse from Genesis 3 is lifted, but there's still some exceptions. And dust shall be the serpent's food. Aha, uh -huh, that didn't change. They shall not hurt nor destroy my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, chapter 66, The heaven is my throne and the earth my footstool. Boy, does that echo the Psalms and elsewhere. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? Contrast that with Revelation 11, the idea of the temple, which is given short shrift there, really. For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of contrite spirit, that trembleth at my word. He that killeth an ox as if he slew a man, and he that sacrificed a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood, and he that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I will choose their delusions and bring their fears upon them, because when I called, none did answer. And when I spoke, they did not hear. And they did evil before mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, and said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. The voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord who rendereth recompense to his enemies. In other words, he's rebuking, of course, the hypocrisy. He's rebuking those that are his enemies. Before she traveled, verse 7, she brought forth, before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion traveled, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God? Rejoice with Jerusalem, and be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for her with her, all ye that mourn for her, that ye may nurse and be satisfied with the breasts of her consolations. There's that idiom again. And ye may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and glory to the nations like a flowing stream, or like a overflowing torrent, as perhaps more precise. Then shall ye be nursed, ye shall be born upon her side, ye shall be dandled upon her knees. Isn't that colorful? As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you, and that ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And when ye see this, your heart shall rejoice, your bones shall flourish like the herb, and the hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants, and his indignation toward his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come with fire, and with his chariots like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. And by fire, boy, fire, fire, fire here. And by fire and by a sword will the Lord plead with all flesh. And those slain by the Lord shall be many. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination of the and the mouse <laughs> shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and I will send those who escape of them to the nations, to Tarshish, to Put, and Lut, and draw the bow, to Tubal, and Yavan. The Yavan's the Greeks, Tubal the, the Puts. Tarshish was to the west in any case, you know, the others to the south, and to the coast so far off, that implies northward, who have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations, and they shall bring all your brethren 
For an offering unto the Lord out of all the nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and in mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, saith the Lord. As the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel in the house of the Lord. And I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. What's he talking about? Israel. Is Israel over? Heavens, no. Paul spends three chapters in the book of Romans hammering that home, but clearly God here in Isaiah hammers it home too. God is not through with Israel yet. It has a very significant destiny. And so it's going to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be in abhorrence unto all flesh. And that ends the book of Isaiah. It's interesting, it says that their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. Let me mention something that's a little bizarre. The beast and the false prophet in Revelation 13 get cast into Gehenna at the beginning of the thousand years. If we study Revelation, you find them in cast into Gehenna at the beginning of the thousand years. Now, Satan's bound. He's not in the fire. The beast and the false prophet of the satanic trinity, two out of three are in the fire, but Satan is bound with Jane, right? At the end of the thousand years, he's released, right? He does a little mischief, and then he's put down. And he's thrown in the Gehenna at the end. That's really what it was designed for in the first place. But when it's thrown in, what the prophet sees there, what John sees there, is that a thousand years later, the beast and the false prophet are still there, knowingly, knowledgeably, enduring their punishment. We're not talking annihilation. There's something about our intrinsic nature that's eternal, that's the good news, that's the bad news. We will spend eternity, whether we like it or not, somehow. There's part of us that we're temporarily at the moment embodied in a body, but we're eternal. It's in intrinsic in God's creation. We will either spend eternity in his presence or out of his presence. If we're in his presence, it's incredible. If we're not, we're not only alienated from him, but without hope, because it's eternal. That's what God's trying to get across to us. We'll either be in fellowship with him or not. God cannot have fellowship with sin. We have a sin problem. No problem. He's taking care of that. And if someone once is quipped, no one will be in hell for their sin. They will be in hell for having rejected the provision God made for their sin. Different ballgame. Anyway, Isaiah really uh, nails it in terms of the, the whole idea that God has enemies. That's a, that in itself is a strange idea, isn't it? But he deals with it. One of the incredible aspects of the life that you and I now observe on the planet Earth is injustice. That God doesn't, why doesn't God do something? He, he will. But what he starts, he finishes. And when the day of vengeance is called, when Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2 becomes Christ's mandate, the day of vengeance of our God. Hey, it's all going to be set, set straight. And all of us, no matter how knowledgeable we are in the Scripture, will probably be startled to realize how justifiably angry God is. He's going to straighten it all out. But not before he's chosen the people for his name, to whom he chooses to ascribe the righteousness of his Son. Where do you stand? Are you in Christ? Are you the beneficiary of his completed work on the cross? Are you really ready for all this? It's about to spring. We didn't get into end time prophecy tonight specifically. We just got through Isaiah. But there are all kinds of indicators he gave us for what's called the day of the Lord, the day of vengeance. Also goes by the 80 and the 70th week of Daniel. This final wrap up. There are all kinds of circumstances that are uniquely being assembled today for that. Babylon is being rebuilt by Saddam Hussein to fulfill Isaiah 13, 14, Jeremiah 15, 51. Magog is getting positioned. The five southern republics being the hooks that will probably draw Magog into this nuclear exchange in the Middle East. It could happen any day now. 
next week, next month, next year, who knows? But boy, it's ready to happen. 22 nations building ICBMs today. 11 nations building nuclear weapons today. Not the U.S. and Soviet Union, all the others, the third world. I'm not talking France, I'm not talking Asia, I'm talking third world. Europe emerging as a super state. The world calling for a world government, including the U.S. Strange stuff, but all, it's bizarre from a secular point of view, and yet necessary as you look at the secular problems, all following the scenario, the script, if you will, of Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Revelation 13, and so on. It's all happening. What's happening? Daniel 70 weeks getting positioned. What does that mean? Church is going to be out of here. There's a window of opportunity. Are you in Christ? We're not talking about joining a church. We're not talking about subscribing to, quote, our program. We're talking about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. He'll take care of the whole job. If you ask him. God has given you sovereignty. Boy, that's a frightening thing. What do you do with the sovereignty God has given you? Only one thing if you're smart. Let's hand it right back. That's the test. <laughs> 